All right, thank you, John. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, appreciate you hanging in this long. Uh, again, Tim Townsend, University of Florida, Environmental Engineering, and uh, I've got several co-authors I'd like to acknowledge, but uh, Steve Laux, who some of you know from, formerly from the consulting world, has now joined the University of Florida, is helping with our research group. Malik Anshasi is the graduate student, and I won't read all their names, but there's a number of undergraduate students that I'll highlight more in a second. As I was driving down um, from Gainesville yesterday, it's a little over four hours to get here, I was, I was uh, uh, surfing around the channels and there was some, I don't know if it was a motivational talk or whether it was a sermon that was going on, but they started talking about, you know what a PhD stands for? And I, st I stopped and kind of paid attention and I, tell me if anybody's heard this before, but it's a pilot high and deep. And so I'm hoping that after today that I'm not just continuing to pile on for you. I got some, a lot of information I want to try to show um, also, in that same talk, um, I think one of the things, though, that the speaker was trying to get at was the fact that we always need to uh, be reinventing ourselves and looking at for new directions. And I think one of the things that the Hinckley Center does in terms of the types of research that we do is we're looking for what are the real problems out there, the problems that are facing the DEP, the municipalities, the consultants, the industry, and the state of Florida. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to shed some light on the project. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. But real quick, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that um, there are a number of undergraduate students working on this project. Um, and as I'll show you on the next slide, the support for a lot of these students is based on the municipalities in the state of Florida right now. So quickly, if those of you who um, recall or the investigators in the room who applied for this Hinckley Center cycle, there were a lot of re research questions on those agenda items, just like you filled out already today, that to me described a, a good deal of anxiety about the future of solid waste management in Florida and how to count it, what should be recycled, should I use plasma gasification, um, is composting anaerobic digestion the right way to do it, what are the costs of all these things? And so the project that I proposed that year was to look at the current state of solid waste management in Florida, to kind of wrap our arms around that big picture in terms of how much waste is out there, where it's going, but then really move a step beyond that and begin to look at what are some of the potentials for moving forward in the future. Now, I know for a fact that folks in this industry, especially in this state, like to complain about the 75% recycling goal, or at least they like to discuss it. So one of the things that we're going to do today is we're going to bring that up and we're going to talk about some of the issues associated with that and where we might go for in the future. Another thing that the Hinckley Center encourages us investigators to do is to find additional support. So I was very fortunate that a number of municipalities uh, or their representatives in the state of Florida agreed to support on top of what the Hinckley Center was providing. So I wanted to acknowledge Latchville County, Escambia County, the Solid Waste Authority of Palm Beach County, Polk County, and Sarasota counties. And while I say that, we're very fortunate in this state right now that we have such an active solid waste um, research uh, endeavors as evidenced by all the speakers already today. And I think one of the unique things about the state of Florida, in addition to the center, in addition to the support of DEP, but also it's the wonderful support of the municipalities. And beyond those right there, I just made making a list, but Hillsborough County, Pasco County, Miami-Dade County, Union, Bradford, Baker County, these are all municipalities who've stepped to the plate to identify research that needs to be done in the state of Florida. So I want to acknowledge them. What I'll cover today is I want to get a little bit of an overview with regard to this whole 75% recycling goal and where we are in the state of Florida uh, in terms of where our waste is uh, being managed, how much is out there. Um, and then you've probably heard, if you've been paying attention to this industry, that the term that's being coined or used a lot these days is no longer waste management, but materials management, or more specifically, sustainable materials management. In fact, if you go to the US EPA's website, you're not going to find the solid waste page anymore. You'll find the sustainable materials management page. I want to talk a little bit about that. And then what I would like to propose to you, and I've gone through this with some of you who've been to the RFT meeting earlier this summer, is some alternatives to the 75% recycling goal. Because it's certainly going to be a challenge to reach 75% by the year 2020. And it's not necessarily the best way to plan and develop and invest resources into how we manage waste in the state. And I'll share some thoughts in terms of future management. I have a lot of slides. I'll try not to go too quickly. But I do want to cover a lot of ground. And I'm happy to discuss any of this with you afterwards or in other meetings. So if you look at 2015, um, which at the time we put these slides together with the most recent numbers that were out there, 32.5 million tons of municipal solid waste generated in the state of Florida. So there's some categories of what we might consider solid waste not in here, 
typically you're not going to include your biosolids as part of this or mining wastes or things like that. If you look at that, uh, the traditional recycling rate, uh, and what I'm referring to is what Florida has normally been counting before they would count things like waste to energy, was 42 percent. So that's a pretty good accomplishment. And I'll show you a little bit more historical perspective in a minute. Combusting almost 4 million tons, and then landfilling almost 15 million tons. So we still re rely quite a bit on landfilling, but we have a very healthy recycling rate. Now, as I'll go through in a moment, if you are to count waste to energy toward your recycling portfolio, toward your credits, you'll see that our recycling rate is up to 54%. And under the current statute and its interpretation, you are allowed to count waste to energy and landfill gas to energy toward that. So you see 54%. The goal to reach 75%, though, is still a fairly uh, you know, decent stretch away from us. If you go back in history, these are the recycling rates in Florida as reported by the DEP since 1988 when the Solid Waste Act first came out under uh, Bill Hinckley and you remember Senator Kirkpatrick that John talked about earlier. Um, if you kind of scroll through the future, we started, what, at, you know, 5, 10 percent. Um, we got up to around 40 percent and then in the year, what was it, 1998 or so, the rates dropped. That was really more of an accounting change in terms of how the state counted construction demolition debris. Since that time, from uh, 1998 all the way to around 2009 or so, it remained relatively constant. Of course, in 2008, that was when the statute came out that established the 75 percent recycling goal. And then at some point along the way, there were various revisions on what could count toward that. If you see the orange bars, the orange bars represent the waste to energy fraction of our recycling. Now notice the blue bars, however, underneath the orange bars in more recent years. You can see from 2011 up to 2015 that there has been, at least with the current metrics, an increase in recycling in the state of Florida beyond waste to energy. With waste to energy, however, we're getting up towards 54 percent. Now the fact that Florida counts waste to energy is something that's a little unique in our country. Uh, a number of places um, may or may not encourage waste to energy, but typically they don't count it toward their recycling goal. If you look at recycling rates across the U.S., and you might see this in the trade literature that comes across your email or your desk, it varies all over the place. And uh, you can see Atlanta had a, a um, participation or recycling rate of about 13 percent or so. But San Francisco and some of the communities out west are reporting at 70, 76, 80 percent. So, of course, one thing to think is, well, shoot, Florida should be able to do that because there are municipalities who are out there doing it. But I think, as a lot of you already know, is that it all depends on how you count, right? It's creative accounting and what numbers you put in there. If you Google San Francisco 70 percent or recycling rate or something like that, this is one of the articles that I found. But take a look at this. This is a uh, this is actually in terms of the amount um, of materials recycled in kilograms per person per year, so you're normalizing it uh, to a person. You can see Berlin, Germany as a whole, there's our San Francisco, and then the U.S. What the green bar, so that's really recycling. That's your recycling and your composting. With that big gray bar that they count in San Francisco is what we do in a lot of cases in Florida uh, or around the country. It's all these other materials. You find lots of brick, lots of of, uh, of, of sud, sludge, or biosolids, or inert materials that now get counted in there. So what you end up having, again, is kind of this case of creative accounting. So one of the things that we wanted to do in this project, which the students have been working on, is to try to track that a little bit more closely. So when I'm done, I'll hope you'll have a better sense of what the true recycling rate is for these different sectors in our waste stream right now. I broke this up into residential MSW and non-residential MSW. Those are typically managed differently. There is certainly a crossover when you talk about multifamily housing because you might have a commercial truck go pick up an apartment complex at the same time, so it's a little bit difficult to separate those two. And then C and D and yard trash. Why? Because those are typically managed separately. They still are important to track and they are counted in the Florida numbers, but we'd like to look at those differently. So I'm going back to what we saw before. Based on our current estimates, and these things are probably going to change somewhat as we refine our numbers with the municipalities, but you're seeing approximately roughly equal, a little bit more residential compared to non-residential or commercial waste, a large amount of C and D, and then certainly a significant or substantial amount of yard trash, though not at the same magnitude as the other waste streams. Let's go ahead and take a look at the recycling rate of these. Now these are based on the DEP numbers as well as some assumptions that we have to make. They'll be refined a little bit more as we get more feedback from the municipalities. For those of you with a county, you might have seen an email or a request from some of the students asking for more data. If you've, if you've helped us with that, we appreciate it. And if not, we look forward to your help. But you can see that 
For Florida right now, we're reporting C and D recycling up on the range of uh, over 50%. Now the blue bar is your traditional recycling and your orange bar is your recycling with waste to energy. If you notice C and D, we're not really getting any waste to energy associated with that, so those numbers are the same. But if you look at residential recycling is the low uh, number on the totem pole here. We're still only getting a little over 20% recycling. And if you look at the municipalities, and I'll show you a couple of municipalities, but as a state as a whole, there's a lot of room to improve in terms of just curbside recycling and collection of those materials. Um, yard trash, again, a lot of that's being recycled, including a fair amount going to waste to energy. Now I'll show you some, some figures that many of you will have seen, and those of you with the department, uh, the DEP will recognize this, and you know, a lot of you should, is that these are the recycling rates kind of sorted from the highest to the lowest, at least for the larger counties in the state of Florida. And you can see up at the top, um, Pinellas, Palm Beach, Hillsborough, Lee, uh, Pasco. What do you, what's in common with all those top communities? They all have waste energy facilities. Okay. Um, if you go toward looking at the smaller counties, what you'll end up seeing is that um, some of the smaller counties have relatively low recycling rates. Um, there's a few counties that do waste energy in here, but for the most part, these are small communities that typically rely on landfills. So let's do this. Let's focus on the large counties a little bit and delve into that a little bit more. And we're going to compare a couple different communities just to give you a sense. And I think those of you who are in the business and practice, it's just a little under 60%. Lee County's at, oh, close to 70% or so. I want to compare these two because what's the big difference? Well, again, Lee County has a waste energy facility and Charlotte County does not have a waste energy facility. So how is it that Charlotte County is able to get those real high recycling rates for just traditional recycling? So we'll start with looking at Lee County. Won't go into a huge amount of detail, but right now, um, you know, based on 2015 numbers, you're talking about combusting about a third of the waste stream, a healthy recycling rate, and then a landfilling rate of around 20%. Um, if you look at the percentage of the materials that are um, um, recycled, actually, this is the percentage of the materials as produced. One thing I want to point out is look at um, the 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 four percent and the and the 15% that start at 12 o'clock and then go counterclockwise. Those are the last two ones there. That's your C&D and your yard trash. So C&D and yard trash in Lee County, as reported, represents 19% of the municipal solid waste stream. Now, if you look at the percentage of the recycled materials in the community or in the municipality, again, notice those two, 20% and 38%. So a very large amount of the recycling is accounted for, and this is not including waste to energy, this is simply the recycling is accounted for uh, by the yard trash in the C and D. If you look at the county with respect to those four same categories I'm talking about before, again, you can see uh, the blue bar representing your recycling rate. Again, very good recycling for C and D yard trash and a very healthy recycling rate for non-residential. But based on the reported numbers right now, from a, from a residential recycling perspective, um, it's still a relatively small amount. Now, of course, they have a waste energy facility, so that stuff that they're burning in those gray bars can count toward their recycling rate. Okay, um, this is their recycling rate breakdown again. You can see, oh, I don't know, 15% or so for residential upwards to over a little 60% for the yard trash. So let's go to Charlotte County. Remember Charlotte County, healthy recycling rate, no waste energy though. Um, in this case, they landfill 41%, recycle almost 60%. Go ahead and look at, this is that same percentage of the waste stream we saw before. So look at those same two pie pieces in the beginning. So you can see 14% of the, of the waste in Charlotte County is yard trash, um, and then 51% is reported as construction demolition debris. If you further factor that into the amount that's actually recycled, it's because of the amount of C&D reported as recycled in the county that you get such a large recycling rate, okay? It's not so much that if you look at the recycling rate from a residential perspective or even from a commercial perspective, that they're outpacing everybody. They're pretty typical to what we see. But for, for, um, for some reason in the county, that yard trash, and that, especially that yard trash, you can see a near 100% recycling rate. And then CE &E gets reported to a very, very high extent. So again, this emphasizes something that I think a lot of you know already. It's really about the numbers and what you're able to collect. And some of these big pieces of the pie really have a big impact. Again, if you look at residential recycling for the state and for these municipalities as a whole, there's a lot of room for improvement there. So you start thinking about getting to 75%. And I'm sure in your municipalities or your communities or with your business partners, you've talked about this uh, at some length at other SWANA conferences or RFT meetings. Um, it's a challenge. 
And there are a lot of technologies that are out there that are being pitched to municipalities all the time in terms of different thermal and chemical and mechanical treatment processes. But let's go ahead and look through some scenarios to get a better sense of what would it take in Florida to get to 75% recycling. So what you're looking at here, this is uh, what I'm going to call scenario A. This is our existing 2015 scenario. Remember, for our, uh, we're at about a 42% traditional recycling rate and a 54% recycling rate. So let's walk through some different steps that if we were to implement in Florida, uh, what potential impact that might have. So one we did is, well, what if we were to build waste energy facilities in Orlando and Jacksonville, our two biggest municipalities that do not have a waste energy facility there at the moment? Well, from a traditional recycling rate, you wouldn't necessarily make any difference. But because you're burning more, you're actually going to increase that number. But as you notice, and, and those of you who know, the idea or the challenge associated with building a waste of energy plant is not insignificant. And so the idea that you put all that effort and got two of them in, you're not going to get to 75% just with those by themselves. Uh, well, let's suppose that we had, oh, I don't know, something like a bottle bill, and we suddenly had tremendous recycling of our glass, aluminum, glass bottles, aluminum cans, and plastic bottles. Well, there's a lot out there, but that's still just a relatively small part of the waste stream. And so we're getting upwards of maybe a 45% traditional recycling rate, but that's certainly not going to get us all the way to 75%. Well, what if we added those other big components? We had really, really good recycling in all our munis municipalities. Um, we added newspaper and cardboard and office paper to all those other components in the waste stream. What we end up seeing is that, well, still, even with all that waste of energy, we're at 63% recycling. If we said composting, source segregated organics, that's something that a lot of communities are trying to work toward. Well, if you recycled 80% of all the food waste which is out there, certainly you're going to get a bump, but you're still going to be a bit away from being able to achieve that 75% recycling rate. C and D and yard trash, same type of thing. There's a lot out there, but as we saw before, it's already being reported as heavily recycled. So there's a limit to how much additional gains you're going to be able to make with respect to that. And then I think the thing that, again, those of you in the industry know, is that the only way that you're going to get to 75% realistically based on current constraints and numbers is you're going to have to recycle everything. You're going to have to take all those approaches, build new waste energy plants, and you're going to have to increase your recycling. That's a pretty big challenge, the idea that you're going to implement all those things. So hopefully, for those of you who didn't have that opinion already, you understand that it's a bit daunting to try to get to 75%. And for those of you who already knew that, this just reinforces what you know. So let's step back a second and talk about recycling rates altogether. Is this really the right way that we as a society, government, should be looking at, as our population should be looking at recycling um, and what our goals are? One of the problems with a recycling rate is it does nothing to track reduction, okay? In other words, if you make less waste, that's not going to show up in your recycling rate. The other thing it does is all materials are treated equally. So you can recycle a brick and you can recycle an aluminum can and by mass, it's going to, it's going to be the same. Um, and then all recycling is treated differently, no matter what kind of market you end up using for your material. So just as a quick example on that reduction issue, let's suppose we had a, a company that had a heavy office paper recycling program, and they're recycling really well. But then they bought all the new double-sided printers, and they, made le and they used less paper. Um, what's going to end up happening in a lot of cases is a lot of the paper that they're no longer recycling um, or that, that are no longer making would have been recycled anyway. So overall, your recycling rate might drop simply because you're making less paper in the first place. Clearly, if our goal is sustainable materials management, we want to think of some way around that. And we're going to get to that in a, a little bit. We're going to share with you some, some things that we've shared with the DEP about potential ways to go into the future. So real quickly, sustainable materials management, you can go to the EPA website, like I said before. Just go to epa.gov uh, slash SMM. That's, where, that's their new waste page. They don't, they don't have their solid waste page anymore. When I think of SMM, this is what I like to think of. This is a facility out in near San Jose in California. It's a big C&D recycling facility. Um, but they go to all these lengths. And this look at the bottom. It was, it was just striking to me as I'm standing on top of this old landfill, all the bunkers underneath. And every one of those bunkers is a different product. So it's no longer taking a big waste stream and, taking, and making one or two or three piles and trying to sell it. It's taking a waste stream and going to extreme extent to get 5, 10, 20 different piles. So you've got different brick, organic, concrete for all sorts of different purposes along the way. So sustainable materials management. Um, one of the things that we can do now is there are a lot of tools out there, and you might have used some of these tools already, to try to track 
how our materials have an impact on the environment or what the environmental burden is. It's one thing to just say mass, but what about things like global warming or energy or toxicity or acidification or all these different things that are out there? So there are different tools, and some of you might use life cycle assessment tools. The one I'm going to show you a little bit about is called WARM. It's an EPA tool. It's really easy to use, um, and anybody in here could do it and, and make calculations on it, and we we'll use some of those methods. So I'll talk a little bit about WARM real quick. Um, the idea is, is that when you manage waste, all those steps in the management of that waste are going to have some impact in terms of, for example, greenhouse gas emissions. Whether it's the transport, or the disposal, or the recycling, if you offset materials by recycling something that's less of those greenhouse gases that would have been produced in the first place. And so typically what we do is we take a given mass of waste, um, we come out with some net CO2 or methane or nitrous oxide, and we figure out what the net emissions are, and we divide it by the, uh, the mass of waste. And we get this emission factor. So you can go to the WARM model, and you can pull all these emission factors out, which are essentially the amount of CO2 resulting per ton of that material being managed in a certain fashion. Um, so these are warm emission factors for recycling of different components that you're familiar with. Notice that it goes to the negative side. So when it's negative, that means you're offsetting greenhouse gas emissions. Which one of these components per mass has the best impact for us if we were to recycle it? Well, it's aluminum cans. It takes a lot more energy and it releases a lot less CO2, or it releases more CO2 to go to I'll say Jamaica, dig up the bauxite or ship it somewhere, process it, get all that aluminum out and process it to make an aluminum can. That's a lot more energy and CO2 than just taking an aluminum can and making a new aluminum can. So the idea is we now have these tools. One thing though is that there are winners and losers in this. And this is something that some of the packaging industry folks are a little bit sensitive to because if you look at some of the materials, they have a much better environmental burden reduction when it comes to recycling. That's something that we'll have to jump through and talk about. So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but if you look at, for example, comparing PET and office paper, depending if you recycle one or you landfill one, has different impacts. If you look at landfilling, for example, if you landfill the plastic, it doesn't do much. But um, uh, if you landfill the office paper, there's actually, um, and, and depending on, uh, and that, notice how that goes positive, you're releasing methane. Okay, so that's a, that's a net impact. Whereas combustion, when you combust the office paper, well, they're assuming that that would have been released anyway because it was from a tree that would have fallen on the ground somewhere. Whereas if you burn the plastic, it's releasing new CO2 because that came from petroleum. So it all depends on how you look. Food waste, for example, if you put it in a landfill, all that methane that we've been talking about today has a big greenhouse gas impact. And then when it comes to source reduction, um, or when it comes to, say, just for aluminum cans, you can see recycling has this huge, huge impact. These all are going to manifest themselves in this methodology that we're about to talk about. How you manage your landfill gas has a huge, huge role in how these numbers are going to turn out. So quickly, the students this uh, summer, uh, thanks to the support of these different counties, have been looking at these life cycle assessments as part of individual counties. We're doing it the same thing for the entire state of Florida and the Hinckley Center funding, but we've also been working with the county. So, uh, looking at Sarasota County, for example, I'm going to kind of just jump into this. You get an idea of their waste stream. Um, here we're talking about, a, again, a large amount of construction demolition debris. They recycle upwards of 60% or so. Um, their recycling rate, if you count all their landfill gas to energy, is upwards of 62%, but they have a standard or traditional recycling rate of 56 to 59%. If you look at all the amount of materials in uh, Sarasota County, you can see that from a metric tons of CO2 equivalent reduction, you have a really big impact when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the C and D debris, because there's so much C and D debris that's out there. But now I hope you get a sense is that as at a municipal level, you can begin to get a sense of how to prioritize what things are more important as opposed to a pure recycling rate. This is for energy. Warm typically does greenhouse gas emissions, and it does energy. So that's typically what we're, what, what we're looking at, okay? Um, let's look at some scenarios for Sarasota County that Matthew, one of the students, ran on this. But this is kind of the current baseline uh, greenhouse gas footprint that he's calculated so far for Sarasota County. This is in thousands of uh, metric tons of CO2 equivalents. Okay, so there's your current baseline. Well, let's suppose that Sarasota County built a waste energy facility. Well, in reality, if you build a waste energy facility and you end up having to combust some things that would have been recycled anyway, waste energy isn't always necessarily, from a greenhouse gas emission perspective, a huge amount of difference. Now, it'll change a little bit when we look at energy. 
If we were to do uh, commercial food waste composting, well, same kind of thing. You get less waste that's out there, but in terms of a greenhouse gas emissions perspective, based on these emission factors, it's not a big of a deal. Same thing if we look at anaerobic digestion. But let's say that we recycled um, office paper. Well, as it turns out, a lot of office paper going in that landfill, you recycle that, all of a sudden you make a pretty big bump. And then, I had the students run the other day, was what if, you, what if you did source reduction and didn't reduce it in the first place? There's nothing more you can do to get your environmental footprint down than to not produce the materials in the first place. Briefly, you do the same thing for energy. You can run through. Now, waste energy definitely has an impact on your energy footprint. Um, but if you start talking about the, the food waste composting or the anaerobic digestion, uh, no real impact. Uh, recycling that office paper does. But again, source reduction by not making it in the first place. So again, the idea is you have this opportunity to be able to, as a municipality, track what your materials movement is and to be able to prioritize based on more than just mass. Now, what I would like to explain to you in a minute and hopefully convince you of is that you can actually use that as a smarter way to get to 75% recycling and actually an easier way to get to 75% recycling. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the solid waste story of Palm Beach County. I just want to give you kind of a, a snapshot. One of the other students is working on this. Um, but what you can see is that, of course, they have the two facilities. They have the RDF facility and then the new mass burn facility. Um, one of the things we've been working with them on, and there are a number of folks from uh, the Solid Waste Authority here, is recycling of ash. So what the student who's working with the county on right now is what is the environmental footprint as well as the um, economics, which I'm not going to share with you today, associated with recycling the ash. Now, ash recycling is a big deal in the state of Florida. A lot of you know this now, and you know that the Hinckley Center and you know, the universities have really been involved with these municipalities doing this. Um, again, you've got uh, Pasco and, um, and then Hillsborough County and Miami-Dade County and, of course, the Solid Waste Authority of, uh, of uh, Palm Beach County. Uh, and then a number of others are interested in this. One of the big reasons that the ash business is moving these days is that that facility right there is solely designed to pull out the small amount of copper and aluminum and potentially gold and silver and platinum and these other things that are in the ash. Right now the big plants pull out what? They pull out the large pieces of steel and maybe some of the aluminum, but there's a lot more that remains in there. This is up in Connecticut. This is another one, slide's a little dark, I apologize, but this is at the South Broward facility. Um, so there's, a, there's a, 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 an operator right there, right now, taking the ash as it comes in and processing it through that. But the idea now is, is that there is an economic incentive to processing our ash. So if you couple that with the potential to take the ash and then to use that as, an, as a product, then all of a sudden we have some, you know, potential win-win scenario. So for example, Matt, who did some work, and I was going to show him in the slides, and he was already left, so I should have, uh, well, anyway. Uh, that's Matt right there doing his, doing his research. But the idea is, is that you can take waste to energy ash, um, and you can process that, and you can make concrete. You can make asphalt. You can make road base out of it. Um, one of the things that we learned, however, is that if you have too much waste to energy ash in your concrete, over time it starts to swell a little bit. There are these reactions that occur called alkali silicate reactions. And does it make sense that concrete and swelling are probably not a good thing to happen together? So the idea is there, what can you do um, to, uh, to address that? So um, I'm just going to show you a little bit of data. Um, I'm kind of going off. I'm going to take a little tangent here. I'm going to bring you back in in a second. But the idea is, is that there's this new recycling program that we can use for recycling waste to energy ash. You see the blue line? That's when you add more, when you add 30% bottom ash, you start to see a higher replacement, or over time, you see these deleterious reactions. But what we've learned over time is that if you add fly ash, but then if you, if you look at that yellow line, that's actually add, adding a glass powder, a glass pozzolan. So where I'm going with this is that we have this potential that if we have a waste product that's used to make concrete, we can take another waste product that we have a heck of a time getting rid of to help offset the problem. And that waste product is glass. I think those of you in the business know that we have a very difficult time right now managing glass from our recycling facilities. And so the idea is, is that how can we mix these different materials together? So that is, I think, a good example of sustainable materials management. But back to the uh, Solid Waste Authority. So the idea is that their current system is, is they have a waste energy facility and an ash processing facility, and they pull out ferrous and non-ferrous materials, and then they landfill the rest. So imagine then that if you were to then take that ash and process it, you could make an aggregate, 
make road base or concrete out of it. You could make a, you would pull out more ferrous, and then typically there's a light non-ferrous, which is your aluminum, and a heavy non-ferrous, which is your copper and brass and things like that in there, which has a much higher value. So where I'm trying to tie this back in is each one of those we can associate with an emission factor. And this was kind of the first uh, attempt uh, of the student to be able to do this, but there's your current recycling benefits with the Palm Beach County Solid Waste Authority uh, waste energy facility from recycling those metals, but if you recycle the additional metals and you recycle the aggregate, you end up getting an additional benefit. Now there's some energy to do that, but the amount of energy that you need to be able to do that is still less than the overall benefit that you get. Now honestly, these numbers I think are going to end up showing a much more pronounced benefit once we get a real good handle on the amounts of materials and metals that are in there. But the idea is, is that for all these different communities now, they can begin to assess on a, pro, on a, on a technology by technology specific basis what their potential impacts are. So the students have been working with the municipalities, figuring out what things they'd like to explore, and then doing this as part of that life cycle assessment. And again, we've been doing work on this whole glass issue, and the idea that you can take glass, which is a problem and expensive to get rid of, and potentially, if you get it fine enough, you can make a pozzolan, like a cement, and actually add it to it, and it has a benefit to the concrete. So we did some work recently, and if you compare the red bar to the red bar, it appears that there's actually even an environmental benefit associated with this compared to glass to glass recycling. Same thing for energy. So the idea is now we have this toolbox to be able to go forward and to project what the potential life cycle impacts are for different solid waste management choices. What would, what would you think would be the biggest limitation to crushing glass up small enough to be able to use it as cement? Because you've got to get it really, really fine. It's cost. I mean, the idea that you're going to have to crush this thing down to a really small powder. So can you get it there? Well, what the current numbers are looking like, and I can share this with you in more detail later, is that if you get, a, we're, we're projecting right now that if you can get about 50,000 tons of glass a year, I can't get that in Alachua County, but I'm pretty sure in South Florida you can get that much. You're beginning to compete with the cost of Class F fly ash, which is only going to go up in price in the future. And not too far behind that, you're starting to compete with the cost of Portland cement. So the idea is, is that this has always been kind of a pie in the sky dream, but the idea is that potentially, I think what you're going to see is you're going to end up seeing a lot of this glass pulverized and used to replace cement. It's a big thing that DOT is really interested in right now. Okay, so I'm going to get to what I think is the more exciting part of this, which I, I hope you will too, but what can we do to better track the 75% recycling rate? Because I think if you go to most counties, they'll say right now, it's a difficult challenge to meet. The idea that you're going to go for 75% recycling based on those numbers. I got a little fly here in front of me, sorry. Um, how do we do that? So the idea is, can we use these tools that are out there, okay? So I want you to pay attention. This is kind of a, this is a, this is a bit of a stretch. You gotta, this is not something you can daydream on if you really want to get it. So what we did is we said in 2008, that is when the Florida DEP, or excuse me, the Florida legislature passed the statute. And they said 75% recycling by 2020, okay? So what we ended up doing is we said, well, let's assume that in 2008, since they felt 75% recycling was an appropriate number, what would be the greenhouse gas emissions associated with recycling 75% of the 2008 solid waste stream in Florida. You with me on that? The idea is that we've now established a benchmark or a baseline that we can shoot toward. It's not just 75% of the mass, but is what is the environmental benefit that the legislature would have felt in 2008 was appropriate to target, okay? And you can see then we get these big old numbers about uh, energy usage and metric tons of CO2 emissions. Notice that they're negative. Well, that's because if you recycle that amount, you get a pretty big environmental benefit associated with that because you're minimizing the amount of materials that are otherwise being landfilled. So let's go back to those same um, targets that we talked about before, those same scenarios. And so scenario A, if you remember, was 42% tra our traditional recycling rate, 42% um, traditional recycling, 54% adjusted. That is how, so see the red bar? That's our target. So in 2015, we're still pretty far away from our target. Well, what if we were to build those waste to energy plants? 
Well, those waste energy plants would certainly move us toward the target, but they're not going to move us a huge way toward the target. The uh, establishment of that bottle bill will move us toward the target, but it's not going to get us um, anywhere clearly near enough. But all of a sudden, if we add in the newspaper, the cardboard, and the office paper, what you find is you surpass the target. The idea is there are certain materials in large amounts that have the most environmental benefit. And this is just greenhouse gas emissions. I'm not suggesting to you that that's the one you want to pick. I'm giving you an example of a metric that you can compare to. As we'll see for energy in a second, it's different. What if you did C and D uh, recycling, excuse me, uh, the food waste recycling? Again, you're not getting as huge of a benefit uh, toward, uh, toward the threshold. And the same thing for the C and D and the yard trash. And of course, if you do them all, that you can meet it. So let me flip through this again, but for energy. Here's where we are with our energy footprint right now, to our, at least for the 2015 numbers, compared to our hypothetical target. And then we can adjust that target. This is just a kind of a, kind of a first stab at what the legislature's intent was for this aspirational goal. We get a bump if we build waste to energy plants, at least in those two communities. Uh, if we do that bottle bill, we get a bump. And again, if we do this recycling of cardboard and, and newspaper and office paper, we get over our threshold limit. Food waste, again, your C and D, and then if you do everything. So the idea then, I guess on some lessons learned here, is that at least with respect to two of these environmental burden categories. Now you might not think greenhouse gas emissions are important or not. You might think that it's water consumption, or maybe it's jobs, or maybe it's some other thing that you could think of. But the idea is we now have the ability to not just focus on mass. Let's focus on a goal that reduces the environmental burden. And, and, and whether you think this is a crazy idea or not, this is where a lot of people are going and a lot of states are going to go. So I really think that this is something that's going to happen in the future. Um, so a couple of lessons learned. With respect to at least two of those environmental burden categories, the results are different depending on the type of material. Again, if you recycle aluminum cans on a per ton basis, you're going to have a bigger impact than if you recycle steel cans. The materials you target are a major role. And then one thing I can't go into too much detail on right now is that the baseline you pick is, a, is, is pretty critical. In other words, you have to establish what that 75% recycling looked like in 2008. If you assume that you burned it all to get to that 75%, you actually have a lower baseline that you can reach. If you recycle it all, you have a much further baseline away. Okay, are you with me so far? I'm going to kind of go through another set of examples here, but let's, let's, we've refined our approach since this first one. And again, we have a working group who's with us on this project, and they are a little bit familiar with this. But the idea is, let's consider that the 2008 goal, 75% recycling, we had a hypothetical management profile of 50% recycling, 25% combustion, 25% landfilling. Let's assume that what the legislature really meant, because ultimately that's what they're talking about now, is 75% of the material not going to a landfill. So if we set this as our baseline, what we can end up doing is we get a new target. And then if you can just accept with me for now, I can normalize those baselines to a recycling rate. OK? And I'll, it'll be easier for me to explain when I show you this plot right here. So what I've done here, and this is looking at 2020 when we're supposed to reach the goal. Let's assume that we expand our waste to energy in the state. And I'm added Duval, Brevard, Polk, Volusia, and Orange County now have some waste to energy. Okay? I'm not suggesting that will happen or should happen. I'm just saying if that were to happen. What you can see in that red line right there, that dotted line, that's 75%. But the orange is measuring it with respect to mass. The red is with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. And the green is with respect to energy savings. And again, there could be other metrics that we can use. But the idea is that if we were to use energy as our baseline or as our threshold, we would actually, we're actually making more progress than we think we are. If you're only focusing on mass, you're making a little bit less progress. So let's look at some other scenarios. Let's do 75% recycling of all the residential materials for newspaper, glass, aluminum cans, plastic bottles, steel, cardboard, office paper, things like that. If you have a community that suddenly dedicates itself and has a much greater recycling rate, you're actually over 75% right now, if you look at these alternative thresholds. Now again, I'm not saying that's easy to do, but what this allows you to do, I hope you're getting a sense of, is it allows a municipality or a state to begin to more intelligently target how they want to get their materials management goals there. It's not simply based on a number like that. Um, here's if we were to do the food waste composting. Again, you get a benefit. Um, the C&D and the yard trash, you get a benefit. And then actually, 
And this is interesting, you know, for you guys and uh, Kim and Corey in the back in terms of DEP, based on the 2015 portfolio, I want to show you these slides. You're, remember, in the statute, you have steps along the way that you're supposed to meet. And I think it's by 2015, you're supposed to be at 50%. At 2017, you're supposed to be at 60%. And then 2019, at 70%. Well, based on these numbers, you're meeting the goal right now. If you, re, if you refocus the target, not on mass percentage, but on environmental impact, be either greenhouse gases or based on energy. Okay, does that make, make sense? I'm going to stop for a second and just kind of maybe repeat some of that. Um, the idea is, is that 75% number one is difficult to do. Okay, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do it. But what ends up happening is we're all playing games with numbers and we're trying to do creative accounting and we're trying to find things that we can put in there. And I'm sure you, like me, have heard all these stories about some of the crazy things different folks have tried to do to make their number work. And it makes a lot more sense to just base it on what the goals of a, of, a, of, a, of a community are or a state and so that you can begin to target those goals. The reason we came up with the 75% thing is to make it maybe a little bit more palatable because that was a legislative goal. That was a statute that came up. And you can still target the spirit of the statute, but now you're targeting, targeting that spirit with respect to something besides just mass. What we've been doing lately is our first iteration of this, it didn't give good it didn't give good credit to source reduction. What it did is, is that it gave you more credit to make the waste and recycle it, which kind of goes against what you really want to do. So we've since adjusted it so that you get those source reduction credits based on the per capita amount of those materials that were produced in 2008. So if Palm Beach County generated one kilogram of cardboard per person per day in 2008, and they're at 0.8 now, they would actually then get a, re a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions would be a reduction toward their 75 percent. Um, so my thought is, is at some point, you know, at the state level or at the county level, what you'd be able to do is you'd be able to get groups of citizens together or community members together and they could say what's important to this county or to this area. Maybe greenhouse gas emissions isn't important. Maybe energy is most important. Maybe it's water consumption. Maybe it's acidification. I mean, there's all sorts of different environmental burden categories that we can deal with. The community decides, then they can establish a metric, and then you can sit and you can work together toward a, a community can plan better toward meeting that as opposed to just a pure recycling number. What's nice about this is that it crowds waste energy. Waste energy, you know, that's part of your goal. There's no longer calling it recycling credit. It is simply doing what it's supposed to do. It's making energy. It's reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So you get credit for that. It also rewards you if you operate your landfill better. Because if you can make less methane and get it out there as part of your solid waste planning, your materials management planning for your community, you get credit for that. So all those things get in there. Now, there's clearly a lot of work to do and lots of people would have input, but the idea is, is that maybe there's this framework that's out there. Um, right now, state of Oregon is heavily into this. Um, they're not doing it the same way, but they're using it to get goals together, but sustainable materials management tools to get these goals that are out there. Region 4 and the state of Georgia are doing a little something with this. And of course, there's talk, and I'll let uh, uh, Kim and Corey address this if they want to later, but maybe in the next legislative session, there's going to be some talk of what to do about the 75% recycling goal. If there's anything else that's going to be needed to discuss that. So um, that's something to look at. Now, even more kind of radical, which, uh, uh, you know, not to pile it on any higher, but the idea is that there are some communities that are saying, you know what, forget about end of life by itself. We want our goals to be based on the entire life cycle. In other words, it's no longer a recycling goal, but let's say if you choose to have certain kind of buildings in your community that have less environmental burden, less energy, less greenhouse gas emissions, that gets factored into your goal. Or if you're a community that practices a certain type of agriculture that uses less water, well, that gets factored into your goal. And so there are some areas that are trying to step back and again, take this sustainable materials management concept all the way to the beginning and to the front to be able to say maybe there's some way that we can have this much more broad uh, set of objectives in terms of what we have to meet for the environment. An example of this is right now, our approach would be you look at food waste and then you evaluate composting, anaerobic digestion, and landfilling. But if you take this bigger approach, and again, I'm not suggesting that we're anywhere near the point of being able to talk about that, but trust me, there are some people talking about it right now, 
is that you look at your consumption, you know, make less food, eat certain types of crops, certain kind of agricultural practice, how it's canned, how it's put together. All those things have an impact on your overall materials management life cycle. Now, whether that ever trickles down to kind of our profession and our community remains to be seen, but just be, be aware of it. You're going to hear people talking about it. And I, and I think, anyway, these sustainable materials management principles are going to be more and more discussed. All right, I'm done. I know I, I kind of threw a lot out at you. But what's, what's, what's pretty exciting is that I think we're really at a point in our, in our, in our history right now where something's going to, we're going to kind of change directions a little bit. And the idea that it's just how much you recycle versus how much you landfill, it's, we, we're going to go beyond that. And we're going to start looking at other impact categories and other endpoints. And, um, and again, I think, it's, I think it fits well for you know, the idea that communities decide what's the best way for them to manage their materials. And they can target their, their process to get there as opposed to doing funky things to get the numbers to meet some kind of arbitrary mass goal. Um, there's the website. Um, we have a working group. And those of you in the room who are on that working group, thank you. And uh, we'll probably meet again sometime in September, something like that. Um, the students are wrapping up most of their intern work this summer. And they'll present those works uh, at that point. And then our goal is to have this kind of white paper document to the, uh, to the uh, working group and then ultimately to the entire solid waste community at some point, probably by the end of the year, earlier next year. Okay, and so I know it's a lot, but I'm happy to try to answer any questions for you. There's one back there, Wes. Yeah, it will. Scrap metal is certainly part of it, and it's going to depend on what the counties report. But yes, if so, for example, if you happen to be in a county that had a big scrap metal recycling program, you get a lot of bang for your buck recycling metal, uh, not just aluminum, but you know other scrap steel. And so you would get an enhanced progress toward your environmental endpoint, at least if it's greenhouse gas emissions or whether it's energy compared to other things. And so the dilemma kind of is, is that you know, we've been talking to some folks from the glass industry. Well, glass doesn't necessarily come out that well with this evaluation. That doesn't mean we don't want to recycle glass, though. Obviously, we want to try to recycle glass. But, you know, you know there are, again, there are winners and losers. Another example that someone brought up is plastics. Well, plastics come out OK in here. But based on the conversations we talked about earlier, what's the big issue with plastics these days? Well, it's ocean and microplastics and all these things that are out there. Well, there's no. There's no warm emission factor for that. So the idea is we have to kind of develop these endpoints that are important to us or important to communities and somehow try to put some metrics associated with that. Yeah, I was just wondering. Um, Where are you? Oh, there. Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds good. I, we, you know, we haven't done that yet, but I would assume that there's science out there that's beginning to try to look at that. I would imagine it's going to be a challenge. And you're getting consensus on everybody to agree on how to equate one type of environmental impact versus another one. But certainly, if we could do that, I will say that, especially for those of you with the municipalities who are supporting these students, they will look at cost as part of their projects. They're not cost in terms of the long-term impacts, but OK, let's say you were to introduce a certain kind of process. What would that mean to your solid waste management costs? Okay. Oh. You, I'll, I'll repeat it. OK, so maybe a little naive question, but it seems like the Florida generates more waste per person than their US average, right? So I yeah. have some ideas why that maybe I didn't look up anything. Sure. So uh, the question was, or the observation was, is that Florida generates more on a per capita basis than the rest of the country. 
kind of the typical thing you hear people respond to that too is number one is it's the way it's counted and typically the states actually base their measurement on what's being thrown away and what's going across scales and things like that um, whereas the EPA number is based on typically just uh, estimating production statistics and how much ends out there and then there's just lots of types of waste that get weighed on the scale but don't get fallen that EPA methodology and then there's the idea that as a state that's heavily influenced by tourism that there's a lot more on the numerator than the denominator in terms of waste coming in per capita but what, what's interesting is if you look at other states though a lot of them all still have greater numbers, and it's not just Florida. If you look at the state level numbers, they always seem to be, at least for the most part, greater than the national level. And it's, mo it's mostly because of how they count. 